Good morning, Dog Nation. I'm Brandon Adams, and this is Dog Nation Daily, the daily podcast for Georgia Bulldogs fans presented by Breda Pest Management. We are happy to have you as a part of our program today. We have what we think is a really fun show for you today. It's the former Georgia quarterback, Jake Fromm, coming up. Jake and I got some really good stuff. Obviously, one of the things that Georgia fans have been really interested in is what we might see from Gunnar Stockton on Saturday. Jake gives you his insight on that, both as someone who knows the quarterback position here at UGA, but also as someone who knows Gunnar Stockton pretty well. I think Jake's got some really good stuff on that. And we recorded this with Jake yesterday. Another part of the discussion we kind of got into sort of sets us up for what we're going to do off the top of the program. So I'll tell you more about that here coming up in a moment. Mike Griffith also here too. Mike will give us some insight on what he expects from G-Day and all those rumors and wild innuendo about how crazy the spring transfer portal could be, which opens up for two weeks on April 15th. We'll do that. Speaking of the portal, a former dog is back in the portal again. Uh, That is probably interesting. But as I said before, I want to begin today by looking at what I think is the best thing about G-Day. And ultimately, this doesn't probably matter all that much. I think it's just sort of fun. But in contrast to a lot of the rest of college football, I think it's pretty fun indeed. So we'll start with that off the top. I'll give you an update as well on a really fun kind of sort of unofficial promotion we're running here around Dog Nation. That's been really cool too. So we got a lot to do over the course of the next few minutes. We're just really glad to have you with us for it. It is Dog Nation Daily, the daily podcast for Georgia Bulldogs fans, presented by Breda Pest Management, and it begins right now. Today's episode of Dog Nation Daily is brought to you by Breda Pest Management, the official pest control of UGA Athletics. Presented by DogNation.com, this is Dog Nation Daily, the daily podcast for Georgia Bulldogs fans. Here's your host, Brandon Adams. We are lucky on this show to have the former Georgia quarterback, Jake Fromm, join us each and every week. That's true again for us here today. We're in that time of year in which Jake's doing some of the OTA stuff with the Washington Commanders. That's the NFL organization that he's a part of. And so during that time of the year, we typically pre-record the interview with Jake the day before it airs. I'm telling you all of this because we recorded with Jake yesterday And a conversation that you're going to hear us have in a few minutes actually set me up for something that I wanted to talk about off the very top of the show. I would say there is one thing about G-Day that I love more than anything else. And to me, it's the best thing about G-Day, especially in contrast to the rest of college football. So I want to kind of have a couple of minutes here of just sort of having fun and telling you why I'm excited about Saturday. And as a way of setting that up, let me say this, is that some of you know I'm a pro wrestling fan. And if you want to go back to, like, old school days of pro wrestling, you had two locker rooms. You had the good guys locker room and you had the bad guys locker room. And the thought was you can't tell the story well if the good guys and the bad guys are entering from the same locker room because if they're all dressing together, then are they really enemies? And if they're all able to sit next to each other and put the trunks on, then are they really, you know, going to get out here and make us believe that they're at each other's throat and willing to fight, you know, and, and scratch and claw and all the stuff that pro wrestling needs you to do. So to tell the story well in the old school days, they don't do as much of this anymore, but in the old school days, you had to come from separate locker rooms. And I love this about G-Day. Historically, anyway, one of the things we've seen from G-Day is the two different teams are actually real teams. And it's the first team offense against the first team defense and the second team offense and the second team defense. And they're split up into two teams And they dress in separate locker rooms. They have separate entrances. You know, typically speaking, the stadium, uh, what do you call it? You know, uh, basically the event team there, you know, has two different videos. There's a a video celebrating the black jerseys for the black team. There's a video celebrating the red team. All of it is sort of set up to look like real football. The score typically starts off zero to zero, and we play something that feels like a real football game. And I'm here to tell you, that is – my favorite thing about G-Day. Now, if all you do is sort of pay attention to G-Day, I don't think you realize how significant that sort of is. But if you're one of these, you know, Georgia fans who's also kind of more broadly a college football fan as well, you sort of realize that, gosh, as the more and more time passes, the more kind of Mickey Mouse a lot of these spring games become. In fact, I want to show you a couple of examples here. I was reading just, just stuff that I've read this week, starting with like one of the big uh, news entities that covers Penn State. Headline. Penn State to play, quote, traditional spring game. The uh, story from, I guess it's WTAJ, says, just days before the annual blue-white game, James Franklin announced what fans can expect on the football field. Unlike, here's the story, unlike how some programs try to throw a unique spring showcase, Franklin said that Penn State's going to play, quote, a traditional game. 
So the idea of Penn State playing a traditional game being, you know, unique enough, that was worth its own story up there in the uh, news media. I, I, I kind of like the way in which whoever the writer is on this describes it as a unique spring showcase. I'm a little bit conspiratorial from time to time. I have a little bit of a conspiracy theory about some spring games. I sort of feel like some of these are almost, I used pro wrestling as an example before. I feel like some spring games are virtually fixed. You know, they're, they're kind of predetermined of, hey, we want the offense to look good, so therefore we're going to put the twos against the ones and give them a chance to sort of kick them around a little bit and it becomes a spring showcase for whatever the uh, coach wants fans to believe about the offense. Sometimes that seems to be the case in some of these places outside the uh, bubble of dog nation here. But uh, the Penn State media entity there saying, hey, it's a headline-worthy event that Penn State's going to play a traditional spring game. Compare that to Ohio State here for a moment. That's a obviously Big Ten rival of the uh, Nittany Lions. Uh, Cleveland.com, big news entity that covers Ohio State, here's what they've reported this week. That Ohio State's football spring game format uh, has been announced, and it's going to be uh, 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 a media advisory sent out Tuesday that said, Offensive scoring is going to be standard, so you get touchdowns and field goals. But now listen to this. This is the most Mickey Mouse thing in the world. But defensive scoring is six points for a touchdown, three points for a takeaway, three points for forcing a three and out, two points for a sack, and uh, one for forcing a punt. According to the release, the first three quarters are going to be 12 to 15 minutes apiece, including clock stoppages. And the fourth quarter is going to consist of, listen to this now, a 10-minute victory lap with a running clock. Now, how much does that get on your nerves, and how much does that sound like Ryan Day and his hair beard to have such a convoluted format for a spring game? And to add insult to injury, this thing is on Fox over-the-air broadcast television. The people up at Ohio State don't have any more respect for the game of football to, to have a real football game for something that's going to be on network television. This thing's going to be on Fox, the network, not FS1, like big boy Fox. And they've got, like, all this crazy convoluted scoring for – you know, what you get for a takeaway, what you get for a three and out, what you get. Like, I can't keep up with all of this. I like the fact that at G-Day, historically, this, you had two different teams. The score starts off at zero to zero, and you score the thing the way the football typically works. I, I really appreciate that. But what's even worse than what Ohio State's doing for a game that's going to be televised on Fox is what Lane Kiffin is doing at Ole Miss. This is coming from Inside the Rebels, who's the 24-7 uh, site that uh, covers uh, Ole Miss. Uh, they're writing this week that Ole Miss has announced it was making some pretty big changes to their annual spring game, the Grove Bowl, which is a kind, of, kind of a cool name for a game, but nonetheless, with a plethora of players, by the way, plethora is always an interesting word to use, plethora of players recovering from injuries in off-season surgeries. Uh, Fifth-year head coach Lane Kiffin has opted to make this year, listen to this, Lane Kiffin has opted to make this year's spring game seven on seven, and they're also going to have various skill competitions as well. They're essentially turning their spring game into field day. They're gonna have sack races and you know three you know three legged races. What are the skill competitions? I don't want to see a skill competition. I want to see football. I don't want to see seven on seven. Listen, there's a thousand seven on games taking place all over the world every single weekend this time of year. If you go to the Grove Bowl, if you go to if you go to Oxford and Vaught Hemingway Stadium, don't you want to see eleven on eleven football? Don't you want to see that? But apparently at Ole Miss, they're doing seven-on-seven, seven, which if there was ever a coach that would opt for a seven-on-seven seven spring game, I guess it would be Ole Miss coach Lane Kiffin. Now, hear what I'm saying. You don't hear what I'm not saying. I'm not here to tell you Georgia taking G-Day more seriously makes them better at football. The honest truth is I actually don't think it probably does. But it is good for fans, right? I mean, it is it is fun for us. And, I mean, listen, if it was seven-on-seven, seven, I'm sure we'd be breaking it down 17 different ways. I'm sure we would. But isn't this just better? Like, I don't want seven on seven. I don't want, old, you know, Ohio State's convoluted scoring system where figuring out who's winning is like doing your taxes. I, I don't want that. I, I don't want it to be a headline that we're playing real football the way that it is up in State College. I just like the fact that Georgia still treats G-Day like a football game. And kind of like pro wrestling, they sort of keep it kayfabe and sort of buy into the idea that you got – Two different teams who, at least for this particular day, sort of don't like each other very much. We're going to talk to Jake Fromm more about that here coming up in just a moment. So I still really appreciate that. Even if it doesn't actually make Georgia a better team, it does make G-Day a better day, and I think that's probably a pretty good thing. Now, in light of the idea that we're taking this seriously, we're treating this as a real football game, I do think as we get closer and closer to Saturday, there is one big storyline 
that kind of emerges here. Once again, all in the mindset of this isn't really real football, but if we're going to pretend like it's real football, let's pretend like there's a very big, obvious storyline here. And that is the whispers, the rumor, the innuendo that somehow the Georgia offense is ahead of the defense in a way that typically in the Kirby Smart era, we haven't always come to expect. And Kirby Smart, if we're being honest here and for being candid, has done a lot to contribute that to that narrative himself. And some of this goes back to an interview that Smart gave to ESPN.com a few days ago. This is something we've talked plenty about, but I want to give you a reminder here of something that Smart said when speaking with Chris Lowe. The question was, what's one of the things that's gotten your attention about this team through the first part of spring practice? And Smart says, well, either we're a little, either a little weaker on the defensive line or we're really good along the offensive line. Smart says, the glaring thing I've seen at practice is the offensive line has done a really good job. That's not to say we were subpar on defensive line last year. We just weren't great. He said we didn't have a dominant guy. Now, this is what Smart says to conclude this line. But we're always going to be good on defense. I don't know that we're going to be great this year, but I think we have a chance to be great on offense. So if you take Smart at his word, and why wouldn't we? Uh, according to Smart, the offense, especially up front, had perhaps gotten the better of the defense some during spring practice. Now, we're also led to believe behind closed doors the scrimmage this past Saturday to the extent there was you know, good uh, intel about that. Defense maybe had a better day and sort of reasserted itself in this overall battle. But, um, but, the, but the kind of sort of prevailing narrative at the moment is offense, a little bit of ahead of G-Day, uh, I should say a little bit of ahead of the defense going into Saturday. So much so that when I, when I was on 960, the ref, I do a Wednesday morning interview with them each week, I sort of jokingly said, that I thought the red team, the first team offense, was maybe about a touchdown favorite over the uh, black team, the first team defense, at least the way we kind of typically expect it to be. I sort of thought, you know, first team offense, maybe about a touchdown or so favorite over the team with the first team defense here right now. But who knows? This Georgia defense, even a little bit shorthanded and even, you know, kind of playing a little bit hamstrung because of the fact that you, even with a sort of a normal G Day format, you're still not tackling quarterbacks and things like that. Who knows, maybe this defense gets a chance to sort of reassert itself and kind of fire back at those who think that for the moment it's not on par with the Georgia offense. With that in mind, you know, yesterday we got a chance to hear from Malachi Starks. Now, Malachi, I would say for now, is the best player on this Georgia defense, but he's also nursing an injury. He's not participating in spring practice, nor will he participate in G-Day there on Saturday. But in light of the people who say, well, you know, a year ago Georgia wasn't as dominant defensively as it had been, and it certainly sounds like Malachi and this Georgia defense still takes that as a good level of uh, motivation. Is it enough to get the nod over the first-team offense on Saturday? I don't know, but the defensive players healthy enough to play? You can expect them to play with a lot of fire based on what Malachi Stark said yesterday. Here is Malachi. We take pride in defense here. Uh, and that, that's the biggest thing. And, you know, we always didn't play how we wanted to. Um, we always finished how we wanted to. Whenever we played how we wanted to. Um, you're never going to play a perfect game. And I think the thing that we just did was just try to hone in on the things that were important, you know. Um, you know, when it plays defense, it takes first level, second level, and third level. So, um, you know, if they if they score, you just can't say, oh, it was a linebacker, over to the D-line, the safety missed a fit. It, if they score, it's for something wrong at all three levels. So um, we just all tried to be on the same page. And taking that from last year to this year, you know, just making sure everybody is on the same page. We all have the sense of urgency, um, knowing what's important. So Malachi Starks says that's what he expects from his defense this year. And as he's watching and probably doing a little coaching on the sideline on Saturday, my guess is he's pushing the Georgia defense to show some of that against this uh, highly touted Georgia offense on Saturday there as well. So bottom line is simply this. At Georgia, G-Day, at least for the most part, still approximates real football. So if we're going to want to watch a real football game on Saturday, that also means real football storylines. And the storyline thus far during the spring is, did you hear about so-and-so on the offense? Did you hear about how good the offense looked? Perhaps at times getting the better of this Georgia defense. Does that play out for our own eyes to see on Saturday? I cannot wait to find out. My name's Brandon Adams, and this is Dog Nation Daily, the daily podcast for Georgia Bulldogs fans, presented today by Breda Pest Management. Happy to have you with us. No matter how you get to us, video 10 a.m. across all platforms. Radio, Athens Sports Radio 96, the rep podcast, posting the show right there at noon. Apple, Spotify, the world famous dognation.com. We love our loyal podcast audience. These are the people who've been with us the longest, and at least in many cases they are. And we are so, so grateful for all of you. And really grateful to our friends at Breda Pest Manager who make today's show possible, the official pest control provider of 
UGA Athletics. That means if you're lucky enough to be sitting inside Sanford Stadium on Saturday, if you're going to the baseball game against Missouri that afternoon, if Foley Field, or anytime you're hanging around the UGA campus, just keep in mind that all those athletic venues protected, bug, critter-free, termite-free, because of our friends at Breda Pass Management. And the same work that our friends at Breda do for UGA, they can do that for you there as well. But more importantly, this is more than just bragging rights. It's kind of cool to say, hey, the official pest control provider of UGA Athletics takes care of my termite, my pest stuff. That's kind of a cool thing to say. But more importantly, the legacy of success and the history of quality service that Breda has provided also gives you a chance to be kind of leveraged some of that for your benefit here too, because they've been in business since 1975, got 125 employees stretched all across our market area, taking care of people all the time. I literally, I'm out and about a lot. I got, you know, all kinds of stuff. I'm driving around baseball and things like that. I see these Breda trucks everywhere all the time. And I know they're out there taking good care of people. And for multiple generations of the Breda family, that's what they've been doing. And they can leverage that for you by putting more money back in your pocket just for making that decision. That's exactly what uh, they want to do for you. Put more money back in your pocket. That's how they want to take care of you. You'll make money literally for making that switch right here, right now, today. So find them online. It's BredaPest.com. B-R-E-D-A. That's BredaPest.com for a lot more on that. Great to have them bringing Dog Nation Daily to us here today. So as I told you before, Jake Fromm in a bit, really good conversation with him. Mike Griffith coming up in a moment, more of a G-Day preview with him there as well. Prior to that, though, I want to go around the doghouse. Now, in a minute, I I got an update on something we started yesterday. Great response to this. I'll give you more information on that. And we're going to do something really cool tomorrow there as well. So I'm going to tell you about all of that here coming up in just a minute. Some really, really good stuff. So stay tuned on this. A little bit of housekeeping stuff, but it's all stuff I think you're going to really like. We're going to get to all of that here in just a bit. Prior to that, let's go around the doghouse. And one of the names we've probably talked about a lot here this week is Gunnar Stockton because the feeling is, boy, it's great to hear the fact that Carson Beck's having such a strong spring. Pretty much all of the rumor and innuendo would lead you to believe that's indeed the case. We're going to talk later on about the fact that another important media outlet has ranked Beck as the top quarterback in college football. You feel really good about that. And yet there is also a fairly strong certainty that Beck at the moment is a little bit of a sure thing. You kind of know what you have for it from him, so – From an entertainment perspective, you're looking forward to watching Carson on Saturday. But from a football intrigue perspective, you might be a little bit more interested in what Gunnar Stockton brings to the table. And you're looking for some hints and some clues about whether Stockton is perhaps ready to travel a similar path to what back traveled to Georgia, waiting, buying his time. It's like three years of kind of waiting for his moment, then emerging as a starter and being becoming very successful. Could Gunnar Stockton go on a similar journey here at UGA? Is he embarking? on that journey here right now. Well, we got a bit of a hint about that going back to the end of last season when Gunner got some extended time in the second half of Georgia's blowout Orange Bowl victory over Florida State. What did Gunner Stockton learn from all of that? Well, Gunner told us yesterday. Yeah, it was awesome. Um, leading up to it, I got a bunch of reps. Um, and uh, just like this spring, I've gotten heck, a couple ones reps, twos, and a bunch of threes. And uh, just because um, – yeah, but I've, I got a bunch of reps, and uh, I think it's, it's valuable. And um, heck, I try to cherish it and uh, just make the most of it. Yeah, I like that from Gunnar Stockton, and I think a lot of us are very curious to see, okay, what's next? What else does Gunnar have on offer? And we saw kind of where he was at the end of last season, but in the life of a football player, these few first months of the calendar year are pretty valuable. You know, what you're learning in January, February, what you're working on in the practice field, March into April. And on Saturday, Gunner gets a chance to demonstrate some development. So how would he define success for himself on G-Day? What is he hoping to show on Saturday? Gunner also talked about that yesterday a little bit as well. Yeah, heck, I want to show to everybody that I can play. Um, that's what I, I tried to do in the Orange Bowl, and I thought I did. And, um, heck, it's an opportunity to just go play a game. That's the way I look at it, play with everybody. A phrase you hear sometimes here on the internet is so-and-so understood the assignment. I I feel like in this particular case, Gunner is demonstrating the fact that he understands the assignment. That's what a lot of us are really hoping to see on Saturday. Gunner says, I want to show that I can play. Like I'm like, like I'm a guy who may not be playing, but I am capable of playing. And that's true. If Georgia needs to call on me this year, that's true as a future starting quarterback, perhaps in 2025. And, As I've said plenty before, for all the buzz we have about guys that could have been at Georgia or might one day be at Georgia, 
In terms of future possible starters for UGA, Gunner is still the guy I'm probably most excited about overall, and I'm hoping to see that backed up by the way that he plays on Saturday. I know that Gunner is also hoping to put all of that on display there as well. We'll make that around the doghouse here today on Dog Nation Daily. Now, a couple of notes here. First of all, there's this. Let me give a shout-out to my friends at Dr. Pepper. And, you know, yesterday we were uh, talking about our master's pool and some people were kind of joining that. And I always enjoy the interactions I get when folks email me about stuff like this. And one of the guys was uh, calling out another soft drink that he loved. And I was juggling him to say, listen, even if you love this other soft drink, just know I'm not going to be biased against you even though I am uh, Team Dr. Pepper. And you better believe I very much am that each and every day. It's the treat I look forward to. At the end of my show here, that's a real thing. I can actually see the uh, the uh, box of Dr. Pepper that we keep our uh, supply in right there in front of me here right now. I love the rich one-of-a-kind flavor of Dr. Pepper, and I would encourage you to enjoy it just as much as I do. Stop by your local Kroger, pick some up today. It's a pepper thing, 23 different flavors, all blended together just perfectly. Nothing on a daily basis makes me happier. That little nice little afternoon pick-me-up, that little fix of Dr. Pepper, it's a great treat for me to enjoy, and I know you'll enjoy some there as well. Great to have Dr. Pepper with us. Now, speaking of uh, the master's pool thing. So yesterday we told you, very unofficial. This is not anything fancy. We're not doing this for money. The feds aren't going to come after us about this or anything like that. But if there was enough interest in a master's pool, we would do that the same way we did our uh, golden shoe bracket challenge not too long ago. And I tell you, we got a great response to this yesterday. So much so that, you know, I went ahead and set all this up. So uh, I know some of you are still getting in, and it's a little bit different than the bracket challenge where, like, the first game was, like, noon on Thursday. You remember, the Masters tees off at, like, 8, 8 a.m. on Thursday. So get your th- your uh, contact information to me. In fact, let me show you this on the screen. Here's what I need from you. I need your name. I need your email, your mailing address, and your phone number. All that's because uh, I want you to have – I want to try to send out some prizes, but also the winner gets a chance to come on the show, so I need to be able to get in touch with you. So uh, send your name, your email, your mailing address, your phone number to brandon.adams at dognation.com. One more time. I need your name. I need your email, your mailing address, your phone number to brandon.adams at dognation.com. The winner of the, of the master's pool gets to come on Dog Nation Daily. I'm also going to try to send out some other prizes there as well. I'm kind of working behind the scenes on some of that here right now. Um, I think for our uh, uh, NCAA tournament, everybody that sent something to me, I got back to except for like one person that didn't mess up on. So, I feel like up to this point, about 10.22 on a Wednesday, anyone who's reached out, I believe I've gotten a response back to you. If you feel like I should have gotten it, didn't, double-check me on that, and I'll try to get that done. But the point is, if you can get that to me sometime today here on this Wednesday, I'll shoot you back over to what you need. Yeah, there you go, a little master's music. You love that. Send that over to me. I'll shoot it back to you, and we'll get you in. What we're doing is we're making like six picks, Top four scores count. We're kind of dividing them into tiers based on gambling odds, and that's what we're doing. So one more time, name, email, mailing address, phone number, brandon.adams at dognation.com. We'll get you a part of our master's pool here and have a good time with that. All right, one more thing to do. Actually, let me save this because we're, we're a little bit late. I've got one more fairly sizable announcement to make, but I'm going to save that for a little bit later on in the show. So for now, I want to keep the conversation going because I don't want to keep him waiting here. Uh, good stuff on G Day. Also, uh, a lot of doom and gloom talk about what might be coming after that. So let's see if we can figure out what's what's real and what's not on all that front. Let's bring on Mike Griffith here today as part of Dog Nation Daily, presented by Breda Pass Management. From Athens and across the SEC or wherever the recruiting trail may lead, here's a DogNation.com insider. Let me bring in Mike Griffith here. And Mike, we were talking off the top of the show. Um, I don't think it makes Georgia better. I really don't. But I do like the fact that G Day still feels mostly like real football. I guess you got some running clock stuff a little bit. You got the you got you know you don't have as much special teams you probably do uh, in, in a regular football game. But it's still for the most part zero to zero. Uh, it it still sort of feels like regular scoring, regular football. And from a fan standpoint, that's a lot more interesting than the like vacation Bible school version of you know activity period that some of these spring games sort of feel like. Uh, I don't know that it makes Georgia better, but it is more fun for fans. Well, it's interesting to see which players step up. It's interesting to see, you know, how the transfers are fitting in. And I'm sure they're going to have Carson throw a lot to some of the incoming receivers. And we want to all see how Arian Smith has progressed. There's been some really positive reports about how Arian's done in the past scrimmages. 
Uh, Dominic Lovett also having a really good spring. I, I don't know that we get a great read on the run game. It just seems like the run game is it's more about kind of protecting your feature backs. I don't know how much we're really going to get to see a Trevor Etienne um, or even Rod Robinson for that matter. And because of the nature of it, you know, it's uh, if it's if it's going to be ones on ones, it, it's hard to run the ball in Georgia football. So that's going to be really interesting to see what the run game does as well. So for me, it's really. You know, there's so many midterm enrollees now, Brandon. I want to say between the transfers and the midterm enrollees, I think that's like 28 new players. So for me, I just want to see how those guys look in a uniform and and who plays well in the scrimmage opportunity. Yeah, what we said a moment ago was if you want to kind of find the G-Day narrative right now, to me it seems like it's been the whispers and the rumors that the offense has been ahead of the defense. Now maybe on Saturday there was a little bit of a pushback on that by the Georgia defense, as you might expect, but – but even Kirby Smart himself sort of contributed to this, that the first-team offense has probably had a better spring than the first-team defense. We are led to believe, uh, true or not. But that's – is that, in your mind, kind of the narrative here of, you know, does the offense validate that with a performance on G-Day? And can the defense do something to sort of strike back on that? They're, they're shorthanded. They don't, they've, they've got probably more injuries. I'd say the format is probably, uh, you know – kind of hamstring them a little bit because you take some of the physicality out of this. But is it fair to say that's kind of the top G-Day storyline of can the number one offense continue to be better than the number one defense based on what the rumor mill has led you to believe has been true for thus far during the spring? Uh, you know, I I don't know if I can draw any long conclusions just because the defense is really oftentimes handicapped in what they do. And Kirby doesn't want to show a whole lot of, of the blitz packages and the offense really doesn't want to show their best either. So I, I don't draw a lot of conclusions from the spring game. I look more individually at players and how they perform, um, you know, because let's face it, you know, they can script this game to go however they want. Remember it was a couple of years ago when it was a televised game and there were offensive fireworks in the first half. And, and then in the second half uh, they pulled Brock Bowers and Ladd McConkey and the defense dominated. So you know, Kirby had a television audience and he, you know, they scored a lot of points early and showed they could play defense and <clears throat> everybody kind of won. But that had to do with what personnel were in the game. So that's why I say I, I don't draw any I, I would really be careful about drawing any conclusions based on a spring football game because we're going to see exactly what Kirby and his staff want us to see. Who are some individual players you're looking forward to seeing? KJ Bolden is one. I asked about that at the press conference yesterday. I was talking to Kai Starks about that. And, um, you know, he's an exciting player. And it's a position in that secondary where you lost three players that are headed to the NFL, your, your safety and your star and a cornerback. Um, so you want to see how some of those young, you know, the young cornerback, the young five-star corner, you want to see him. Uh, obviously, you want to see, uh, you know, Xavier McLeod, the incoming transfer from South Carolina. He he looks the part. Can he be a contributor? You want to see what some of those younger guys can do. We know Kristen Miller had a pretty good scrimmage um, against the offense and in, in scrimmage, too. So, uh, the, you know, there's just a lot of areas that need to be shored up. I want to see the receivers. Uh, I want to see Colby Young, the, the receiver transfer from Miami. I want to see London Humphreys and Michael Jackson the third. I want to see what they bring. I want to see how ETM looks out there. I know he is smaller. He probably won't get a lot of reps. So those are some of the newcomers I'm interested in. And, and, and that's just seeing where they're at right now and how they're used. I mean, again, you know, the coaches aren't going to let the cat out of the bag and give everybody a bunch of game film on what they plan to do with everybody. So um, it's probably going to be limited, but I think you can tell by watching, you know, just in terms of how explosive these players are, uh, maybe you can pick up on their ball skills since they're playing football. It's not just warmups. It's, it's 11 on 11. So for me, it's uh, seeing how the, the newcomers do. And then I, I suppose I want to see how in charge Carson looks. I mean, I thought he looked in charge last year, uh, but is he more assertive? Does he look more vocal? Is he getting in players faces? Is he pumping up his teammates? You know, to me, these are things that would make him a better quarterback and that, um, you know, Kirby's talked about uh, that, you know, he hasn't been the most demonstrative guy. Uh, does that change? Is he taking a more ownership of the team now that he's a second year starter? I, I think he probably has. I'm I'm very bullish on Carson and I'm expecting on him looking really good on Saturday. Yeah. And beyond that, we've also talked a good bit this week about uh, Gunnar Stockton, who, you know, it's a different situation because last year Carson was competing to become a starter. But what you saw from Carson, at least I felt like I did, uh, I saw a guy that had the appearance of being much more mature, much more, just much more ready in spring of 2023 than he'd ever been at any point in time prior to that. 
during his time at Georgia. And, you know, Gunner still has the luxury of not having to be the guy here this year. But does he show you some hints that he could be the guy, both in terms of, well, if, you know, Carson were to get hurt and he needs to step in and play for a brief period of time or something this season, or perhaps as a future starter in 2025, you know, Carson Beck's patience was rewarded. He waited, and I think he became a better football player because of that. Is Gunnar Stockton going on a similar journey? That's one of the things I also think is kind of fun about Saturday. It gives us at least a little bit of a glimpse about kind of where he is in that process. Because I'll tell you, Mike, I still am of the belief that Gunnar is a very intriguing quarterback prospect compared to quarterbacks that Georgia could have had, Georgia quarterbacks that they might eventually have. I still think Gunnar is a very intriguing prospect compared to any other quarterback you want to put him up against. Yeah, I mean, he's a guy that, you know, holds Georgia high school state records for total touchdowns and total yardage. And, um, you know, he, there's obviously been a lot of great Georgia quarterbacks. You know, what he did at Raven County was fantastic. I, I think it's a little different offense if he's in there. I think he's more of a dual threat. His ability to run the ball uh, really adds another dimension for Georgia. I think you saw that in the Orange Bowl. Um, and, and I think that you would probably call the offense a little different. And, and that's fine. I, I think that you adjust your offense to whoever's at quarterback, but but maybe the difference between Carson and Gunner is a little bit more extreme than we're used to, um, because Gunner, you know, has had he said he had some some tough practices. He had a good good scrimmage early where he said he completed about all his passes, and then he said he's had some bad days, um, and and that is typical of, of any quarterback. Uh, I don't know that I think Gunner Stockton has the NFL upside of Carson Beck. Because I don't necessarily, I have not yet to see him throw the ball as well as Carson or as consistent. Uh, I'm sure he can run the offense at the line of scrimmage. Um, he brings, again, he brings a dual threat. You know, but Carson Beck has special arm talent. I, I would venture to say that Carson is, you know, perhaps the most talented Georgia quarterback uh, since Matthew Stafford. If you're just measuring it on uh, arm talent and, and NFL qualities alone. That doesn't mean Gunner can't be a good quarterback. He certainly can. I mean, we saw that with Stetson Bennett early in his career. Um, you know, Stetson wasn't the most accurate guy in 2021. He got much better in 2022, and they designed the offense around him. And, you know, I kind of look at Gunner as kind of like a Stetson Bennett. I mean, he's a guy with good mobility and and toughness. He's a gamer. Um, and so, yeah, I, th I think he could be an effective starting quarterback for Georgia if, if he's given the chance. We just – it sounds like there will be a transfer portal coming back, quarterback coming in. I, I just don't know who it'll be. And will that guy be good enough to be the number two um, or will Gunner hold the job? And if you're going to get a number three, why bother? You know, I remember asking Dabo Sweeney uh, about his, um, about his strategies on multiple quarterbacks. And this is back when Trevor Lawrence uh, came in and, and, and took the job. And he said, you, you don't recruit backups, you recruit starters. And then you see who starts. And, and I think that's what George is going to do. I think they're going to try to recruit somebody that they feel is capable of being a starter. And then, as Gunnar said, it's supposed to be about battles and competition. So uh, I know I know that's saying a lot, uh, but at the same time, I, I think it's a complex question. So that's an interesting comparison between Dabo and Kirby. Now, what I would say is that speaks to a pretty big difference between the two programs and perhaps why Clemson has struggled as much as it has late. Because what we've seen from Georgia teams under Kirby Smart is – the 85 scholarships are utilized to their absolute maximum. And we spend most of our time wondering how Georgia is going to get down to the 85. Places like Clemson, we've seen them go to bat during the season with 70-something players on scholarship. They are not as deep of a program. They don't make as many offers as a program like Georgia does. They just don't recruit the same way UGA does. So while I certainly would believe that Dabo Sweeney is probably not as interested in his backups as the programs are, I would say one of the things that has made Georgia Georgia is the fact they do think about number twos. They do think about number threes. They think about scout team. They think about having a third team offensive line so they can get more reps during practice for a third team, you know, unit overall. So I think it's a very interesting quote from Dabo Sweeney. I would suggest that that's a pretty stark comparison between both, you know, Kirby and Dabo and perhaps not in a favorable way for Dabo when you see the way in which that program is you know, can, you know, kind of receded in the background a little bit the last couple of years. Well, I, 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 may, I may have, I may have misspoke. Um, he, he, what he's saying is that every quarterback that he recruits, he believes has the potential to be a starter. That, that's not to say that they don't develop players that are on their second and third team. He's just saying that you don't go out and sign a quarterback with the intention of them being a backup. 
I think Georgia goes out and recruits starters at every position too. I don't think they go out and recruit guys and say, oh, this is going to be a good second or third team player. I, I think they recruit every year players that they believe have the potential to start. And then over the course of the careers, um, you know, the, the, it sorts itself out, right? Iron sharpens iron and, and guys are in different places on the depth chart. Some have the potential uh, to work their way up. Uh, Trayvon Walker, a great example. Uh, Quay Walker. Um, but but I, I I I may have been misunderstood a little bit there. Deb Debo's not saying that he doesn't develop backups or that backups don't develop at Clemson. He, what he was saying is when you sign quarterbacks, um, you believe that they can all start or else you don't sign them at a program that's playing at a championship level. I mean, um, you know, when you look at Dabo and Clemson, they won two national titles just like Georgia did in the college football playoff era, and he had success against Nick Saban. They have fallen on hard times. Um, I do think that him being somewhat averse to the portal has hurt his program, but I also think they don't have the resources that Georgia has. I also think that being in the ACC uh, is a crippling blow because they don't get the same amount of television revenue distribution. So they don't have the money um, that the SEC schools have, and, and they're in a real pickle. Uh, them and Clemson, Clemson and Florida State both. So I, I don't think this is a knock on Dabble Sweeney. I think Dabble's a Hall of Fame coach. I think he's done a great job. Um, I think they did a whale of a job the last time they played Georgia. Um, we still remember they kind of crossed even Todd Munkin up. You know, they thought they were going to get one defense and they thought they were going to get all this Clemson pressure and then it didn't come. So they did a great job. I think Brent Venables was still there then. So I think Dabble's bigger issues right now are, is the staff uh, and the budget. And to your point, um, they have not done a good job in the portal. Um, and, and Georgia hasn't had to mm -hmm. until recently. And now we look and see five of the nine transfers on the Georgia team are at the receiver position. So um, every program, though, Brandon, has shortcomings. Every program has things they want to work on. Uh, it's interesting when we talk about Georgia. When I talk about Georgia, you know, I'm setting the bar pretty high, right? I'm, I'm comparing it to 2021 Georgia, which had five first-round defensive linemen, and that's just ridiculous. Um, but, you know, we got used to Georgia being just – the most dominant team. Uh, and, you know, they still haven't lost a regular season game since 2020. It's not like George has gone anywhere. Yeah. George is right there. They're a field goal away from perhaps another national title. All right. So in the time we have left, uh, post G-Day, you're going to move into starting April 15th, the two-week period of the transfer portal being open again. And a lot of Georgia fans, perhaps rightly so, are concerned about what this could be. Now, first of all, I'd believe anything. I mean, we're in a time in which – I believe, you know, pretty much anything. Uh, and yet I'm also kind of on guard for some of like the real heavy sort of doom and gloom of, oh, you guys better just buckle up for whatever. I'm a little bit on guard for some of that, you know, there as well. So what do you think that two week portal period is likely to be like for Georgia and the rest of college football overall? Because last couple of years, I would say that the spring portal has been a little more quiet in terms of high-quality players available than the winter portal has been. And this year's portal period is also a little shorter as well. What do you think that spring portal is going to be like? Well, it's really interesting um, because of all the talent they brought in in the secondary. And I think there's a feeling that there's so many good bodies back there. There's so many great players with great potential back there that maybe somebody gets squeezed out. Um I think Georgia, I, I don't think they won the portal last year, just to be honest with you. I, I don't think that getting Dominic Lovett and Ra Ra Thomas equaled losing a Donnie Mitchell. I, I thought they lost on that trade. Um, so a bit, a bit different, you know, other years, you know, Lawrence Cager came in and was fantastic. And Eli Wolf came in and, and filled a, a really good need. And hey, Stetson Bennett wasn't a bad transfer either. If we want to get technical, he transferred back from Jones Junior College. So Georgia has done well in the portal. I think Trevor Etienne is huge. I think this is a great addition. I'm excited about it for Georgia. Um, but to your point, there are going to be some guys that leave. And Kirby has told us, that attrition is good. It's it's a good thing. But what what he wants to see, he wants the young players that are freshmen and sophomores to give it a chance to develop. Now, if you're a third-year guy 
uh, or fourth year guy that's running third or fourth string, it's healthier for Georgia and for you to go somewhere else where you can start. Um, there were some, uh, you know, a couple of veteran players, I think, are Syracuse, uh, maybe a good example of that, or a couple of players at Syracuse. Um, you know, or Purdue is a good example. I think Purdue has four Georgia guys, and I had a chance to talk with the Purdue head coach, Ryan Walters, and he's thrilled with he's thrilled with the transfers that he got. And he loves them, some Island Green and Delanis. Uh, Dylan and Morissette. I mean, they're, they're just absolutely thrilled with what they have. So I think those are the kind of players that leave. Uh, you know, there's been some exceptions. There's been an outside linebacker or two that have gotten away. But look, when you've got as much talent as Kirby Smart recruits, you can't get them all in the field. And I think what happens is Kirby has a good uh, communication with his players. I think that he has a pretty good idea right now who's going to be on his roster and who may be entering the portal. And he probably has some players targeted that George is going to be bringing in. I mean, I thought the Bear Alexander uh, being in the portal, I mean, could Bear Alexander come back and, and be an impact player at defensive tackle? Is he a train wrecker or a havoc maker? I, I don't know. Um, I, I'm not sure, you know, the, the quarterback situation, right? It, it, will there be a quarterback that comes in? that uh, could be the number two. I, I don't know that, but it sounds like Gunner said, Coach Smart said there needs to be four scholarship quarterbacks, and and he agreed with that. So I don't know about doom and gloom. I don't look at it like that. Um, sometimes you, some you win, some you lose. Um, losing to Donnie Mitchell was tough. That was that was a game changer, uh, I thought. Um, but maybe Trevor Etienne is the game changer this year that leads the dogs to another national title. We shall certainly see, Mike. Thanks for your time on the program today. We look forward to seeing you on Saturday there for G-Day. Of course, back here on uh, Dog Nation Daily against, uh, not against, but presented by Braided Pass Management again very soon there as well. Thanks for your time. All right. Thank you. Let's take a look around the rest of the league. This is SEC Through. Yeah, so, I mean, look, we know this is what's next, right? And we also are aware that last year on G-Day, you know, the Barry Alexander stuff was happening while the G-Day thing was going on. So, you know, I don't have any sort of, you know, actionable intelligence on that right now, but it's interesting that Mike sort of goes there with, you know, the what in some people's minds sort of a crowded situation at cornerback. And Harris, who there had been some rumors about with uh, Julian Humphrey, who there had been some rumors about. Uh, obviously, Dalen Everett, the guy who played more a year ago, and Ellis Robinson is the guy that, is such a talented prospect that, of course, he's going to earn buzz. I think this is a situation, just from the outside looking in, this is not like expert analysis. This is just my sort of knee-jerk take on this. I think it's a situation where it seems like Georgia may have more than two starter-level players at that cornerback spot. The phrase that Smart's been using a lot this offseason is above the line. You know, uh, the best that I can tell, my assumption is, maybe that's a better way of saying it, my assumption is that Georgia's probably got a handful of cornerbacks who are kind of above the line. Just so happens that's the spot where there was transfer rumors back during the winter. So what I'm hoping to see on Saturdays, I'm hoping to see a pretty healthy rotation. You know, seeing a lot of those guys playing really frequently in the thought that much the same way that Georgia's kind of rotated a bunch on offensive line, why couldn't you rotate a bunch at cornerback, assuming that, that you know, those players continue to be kind of above the line the way that you sort of think they might be. So, you know, who knows? We will obviously see, and we'll be ready to kind of follow it and talk about it wherever it kind of, you know, goes from there. But there's no doubt that kind of one layer below the surface, there's a lot of fan chatter right now about what March 15th might look like when that brief portal window opens up. So we'll see where it goes. For now, they're going to go cruise around the SEC, courtesy of Royal Caribbean. And I know where we're going on that, a portal straight to Port Canaveral for April the 22nd, getting on board and being there at Perfect Day Coco K. I mean, can you believe that? Now, we're also going to NASA on the Bahamas there as well, which has a lot to offer there too. But admittedly, I am very, very partisan to Perfect Day Coco K. I just love it. Look at those cabanas over the water right there. Uh, I mean, wouldn't you love to do this? Talk about the lap of luxury here. One of those over the water cabanas like being in Bora Bora. Uh, you got the Hideaway Beach there. They've got their own cabanas there too. You can also kind of rent and be a part of. Uh, you've got Oasis Lagoon, the wonderful pool there, Thrill, 
uh, water park there, tallest water slide in North America. You've got the uh, chill side there too. And really, you know, when you see Splashway Bay and some of the things that uh, families get a chance to enjoy, there's no better family vacation right now than what Royal Caribbean offers, but also brand new at Perfect Day Coco Cay is Hideaway Beach. And it's kind of a Vegas pool party vibe. You know, you've got the DJ kind of in the pool, you get the swamp bar, so many great things going on with our Royal Caribbean right now. Perfect Day Coco Cay, big part of all of that. Now, Jessica Slater is the one who helps us plan our Royal Caribbean cruise vacation. Uh, and you can give her a call, 770-718-9147. That's 770-718-914. Uh, let me try that one more time. 770-718-9147. I have a tendency to talk a little fast sometimes, and sometimes it all just sort of runs together. Jay Slater at dreamvacations.com. That's also the email address there as well. And you can do like we've done, plan your own Royal Caribbean cruise vacation here in 2024. Mike brings up Bear Alexander a moment ago. Bear Alexander, as many of you are aware, is on the move again. Last year at this time, transferring from Georgia to USC, now is leaving USC. He's going to be transferring elsewhere. I do not believe Bear Alexander is coming back to Georgia. I don't believe he'd be welcome to do that. But I will tell you this. I do believe Bear Alexander can still play. And I think there is sometimes something to be said for getting the guy. You know, I like they sometimes say in sports, you don't want to be the guy that follows the guy. But sometimes you do want to be the guy that follows the guy who follows the guy. And I would say in the case of Bear Alexander, maybe it's the same way. It's like the version of Bear you got a year ago when he was sort of feeling after doing a couple of nice things in the national championship game, he was the next big thing. Maybe that's not the time to be in the Bear Alexander business, but maybe a year after being at USC and realizing what a dumpster fire that team is on that side of the ball, and now you realize, okay, well, now I'm sort of, you know, moving into my third year out of high school and my clock is ticking for going to the NFL. I mean, I'm not going to tell you that Bear Alexander can't be a valuable component to some team's defense. Maybe it's like a situational pass rusher. I don't know how valuable he is on first and second down right now, but on third down, there may be a little something to it. Um, so I'm not going to tell you that Bear Alexander doesn't have talent that won't make him attractive to somebody. I just don't think it's Georgia for, for a second bite at the apple there on all of that, and perhaps with good reason. And the other thing is, we're, we're a little bit old-fashioned. We don't pick on players. We don't We don't certainly go after Georgia players. We don't even go after, like, rival players. We just we, we have a kind of a little bit of a soft touch compared to the players. We go after coaches a little bit more. Frankly, you know, if you're making millions and millions of dollars, you can fend for yourself. Coaches are big boys. Players, even in the NIL age, which a lot of these guys are getting, you know, significant money, we don't beat them up too much, and we're not going to beat up Bear Alexander too much either. However, honesty compels me to admit that in the sort of win-at-all-costs, cutthroat game of talent acquisition right now, pointing out proofs of concept is fair game. And looking at a defensive lineman who's perhaps considering Georgia and USC and telling that defensive lineman, be careful you don't become the next Bear Alexander. Be careful you don't waste a year of your life being a part of a program that's not serious. And USC is not serious. There's some Trojan fans who are probably watching right now who are like, yeah, but we hired a defensive line coach. He coached Aaron Donald. That's all fine and well. Go out there on the trail and try to sell – I know we weren't serious before, but now we're ready to – now we're doing business. Now we're ready to do the things we should have been doing all along. Not always a very easy sell. What we do know about Lincoln Riley is this. He's had two different stops at major programs as head coach, and he hasn't had a defense yet. And he hasn't fully developed the potential of a defensive player on either of these two programs. Not USC so far, not Oklahoma ever. And if you're a young man who has prodigious talent, you don't want to give that talent over to a Lincoln Riley and have him hold that talent hostage the way that he has for so many other defensive players who thought now it's going to be different. But with the pillow soft Lincoln Riley programs, it never is. And we're not going to pick on Bear Alexander, but we think it's fair game to point out that defensive guys who've gone to play for uh, Lincoln Riley have squandered the seasons they spent with him. And be careful you don't become the next cautionary tale and all of that. We just think it's fair to point that out. I thought it was very interesting to see that uh, Carson Beck has been named top quarterback by ESPN. The, the sort of all the lists that we've seen here thus far of top returning quarterbacks in college football have kind of all had Carson Beck there at the top. By now, we've kind of gotten used to seeing that. And as we've talked about before, you know, G Day being a little bit of a glimpse to kind of. I, I, you can't confirm yourself as the best quarterback in the country based on the way you play in a spring game, but looking the part. Is fun for fans to see. But I think it's also interesting to see, you know, what else is going on behind Carson Beck. If Beck is sort of thought to be the top returning quarterback, 
What's happening behind Carson Beck? That was interesting. The ESPN list, they had Dylan Gabriel. Now at Oregon is the number two guy on that. You know, maybe at this point in time, that's the way that Oregon's going to be. They're just going to transition from uh, a good transfer a year ago, Bo Nix, to a good transfer now, Dylan Gabriel. Perhaps that's the case. I also think it's somewhat interesting that, you know, we've talked a lot about the hype around Ohio State, you know, thus far this season. And we, I think we had on one of our shows this week the idea that, according to one of the online, you know, sports books right now, uh, 44% of their national title bets are going the direction of Ohio State, far more, more than twice as much on a per-dollar basis as what's come in on Georgia. But it's interesting to note that when you look at top 10 like this from ESPN.com, Will Howard, the transfer from Kansas State to Ohio State, he's not on this list. He's not to be found. And you are left to wonder, well, is Ohio State going to really be that good if they don't have one of the best quarterbacks in the country? Because, you know, positionally, position value-wise, we've come to expect the Ohio State quarterback position to be kind of worth a good bit. Uh, perhaps it took a little bit of a step back last year with Kyle McCord, but is Howard a true upgrade over Kyle McCord? I think there's a very fair debate going on right now about whether or not he is. Maybe that's the case. I think we're also not quite so sure how Chip Kelly, who's respected as an elite offensive mind, but is his brand of offense going to be better than what Ryan Day's brand of offense has been? Because you can knock Ohio State for a lot of things, but I've never really heard Ryan Day's play calling criticized all that much, unless it's a late game situation, which the game's on the line. At that point in time, he sort of turtles up a little bit. But but during the the regular portion of the game, I've never heard a lot of criticism for Day as a play caller overall. So the point is, by now we've come to expect Beck to be treated as the best quarterback in the uh, country. Maybe he'll prove that to be true. But who's his top competition? That tells you a lot about where this season is going. Let me also uh, mention one more thing here for a moment. And listen, I promise we're not CNBC or Bloomberg or something like that, but I do find this story to be a little bit interesting. And I kind of asked uh, our Cody Chavins, one of our producers, if I was right about this, and he's, his memory is the same as mine. So there was a story that came out this week that in 2025, Auburn, which for a long time has been an Under Armour sh school, is shifting over to become a Nike school. And what I was asking is, doesn't it seem like, and some of y'all know like the gear world better than I do, and I guess ironically I'm wearing an Under Armour shirt today from the Rose Bowl uh, back in 2017, but doesn't it seem like about like 10 years or so, a little bit less than 10 years ago, doesn't it seem like Under Armour was about to be the thing in sports apparel? Steph Curry was an Under Armour guy. Jordan Spieth was on top of the golf world at the time. He was an Under Armour guy. You had Auburn embracing Under Armour, South Carolina, the we will protect this house. Remember those commercials that are on all the time? The Under Armour, like, chief executive was a Maryland guy. There was this thought that Maryland was going to be the new Oregon, and they were going to wear different uniforms every week, and they were going to, like, have a big, you know, uh, sort of pre-NIL apparatus to get players or something along those lines. Like, that all just went away, didn't it? I mean, like I said, I, I'm not telling you their stock. I, don't, I have no idea what their stock price is or anything like that. I mean, this is not a business conversation but am i not right in saying like less than a decade ago under armor was sort of thought to be the next big thing and now with auburn shifting from under armor to nike a little bit of an example of we just don't hear as much about under armor as we used to do we and i guess the only reason why i find this interesting is listen i'm not the world's biggest nike fan not necessarily either but um you know georgia has said this year they're studying nike and i think a story like this, if I'm right in terms of how I'm reading this, is perhaps a reason about why Nike is worth being studied. It's because, you know, ever since, I guess, what, post-Michael Jordan, they've been sort of the name in the apparel game. And a lot of folks have tried to take them down, and Under Armour apparently took a pretty big swing. But somehow, some way, Nike's still on top. How do they do that? How do they maintain their brand value um, with a upstart like Under Armour taking a pretty big swing. Perhaps that's the reason why Georgia's studying them to the extent that they are. I find that to be pretty interesting. All right, let me do one more thing here before we bring on Jake Fromm as a part of our Kroger Fresh Take. We'll kind of wrap that up as far as our uh, uh, cruise around the SEC courtesy of Royal Caribbean. Let me give you a heads up about this. So tomorrow during our RS Andrews Cooldown, this is a total break from protocol. This is an unprecedented deal here, but we believe the buildup to G-Day is worth doing this. We are going to take some calls live on our RS Andrews Cooldown tomorrow. So if you want to join us the way you do for our Dog Nation post game show or some of the shows that we've done 
right time. If you want to do that tomorrow during the R.S. Andrews Cooldown, you get a chance to do that. We just want to kind of do some G-Day storylines. We'll do some recruiting stuff. We want to do the portal thing. We'll kind of do uh, – well, we'll just sort of do whatever. Not for a 1,000 hours because we don't have time, and nor, nor do you. You've got stuff to do as well. But we will do it for a little bit tomorrow. So for the R.S. Andrews Cooldown tomorrow, which takes place immediately after the show – if you want to be a part of that show, we'll give you a link to join. You can call in. Some of you have been saying, when, when are y'all going to do calls again on Dog Nation Daily? Well, the answer is tomorrow during the RS Andrews School Dance. You get a chance to do that. That should be a lot of fun. Now, speaking of calls, we had a chance to conduct one yesterday with the great former Georgia quarterback Jake Fromm. He had a lot of very interesting things to say. So what do you say we keep that conversation going right now as a part of a Kroger Fresh Take? Bring on Jake Fromm here to the program today. And here on Dog Nation Daily, time now for a Kroger Fresh Get a chance to welcome in the former Georgia quarterback, Jake Fromm, to the program. Obviously, lots to talk to Jake about as the dogs get ready for G-Day on Saturday. Uh, Jake, obviously, welcome to the program. We appreciate your time. And I'm curious, if you put yourself back in the position of being a Georgia football player again, what's the mindset here? You know, spring practice coming to an end, are players looking forward to that? Maybe, you know, are they uh, thinking about summer? Like, like, what are you thinking about right now if you're a Georgia player knowing that your spring practice ends uh, on Saturday? Yeah. Hey, Brandon, what's going on? Uh, as always, glad to be here. Thank you for having me. And um, for me, I always look at G-Day as more of a, it, it was fun. It was an event. Um, you know, spring ball sometimes can kind of drag on. It, it, it can be tough at times, you know, because you, you're not, you're not prepping to play anybody. You're just playing yourselves and hitting each other for, for 14, 15 practices. So G-Day to me was, was a, an opportunity to go out and have fun, really enjoy it. Um, it's an opportunity to to practice in front of a lot of fans and um, it really just kind of show, show everybody, you know, uh, else the, the work that you've put in all winter and all spring and, and here's our product and we're going to get a lot better. Um, but, but here we are right now. And um, for me, it was just a, a lot of fun and um, really just, uh, just getting a lot of family in time in, in town and, it's an opportunity to play football, not yeah. in football season. No doubt about that. You know how we all are, too. We're all trying to listen and hear these rumors of who's doing what. And everything we've heard thus far, and you would obviously expect this to be true, is that Carson Beck's had an outstanding spring. And I think a lot of us are curious of saying, you know, what does he look like now, especially compared to a year ago when I really felt like he took some, you know, on G-Day he kind of demonstrated the kind of player he could be during the season. And now you sort of expect to see – a little bit more growth, a little bit more maturity, just, you know, kind of putting on display the the different version of himself here for 2024. As somebody who knows the quarterback position well, like what would you expect to notice about Beck? Is it the way in which he distributes the football? I know it's not a you know, real football game. He's not being tackled to the ground. So some of the best of Carson Beck, perhaps not on display then, but, uh, you know, what do you see from a guy like Carson, you know, kind of demonstrating now the confidence of kind of knowing he's the guy and, Obviously, uh, everybody expecting to have a very big year. Yeah, I'm going to speak on kind of both sides of my mouth here. One, I expect Carson to pick up exactly where he left off. Uh, he left last season on a very high note. Um, and and all the reports that I've heard from spring is that, you know, he's killing it. He's doing great. He's making strides, uh, becoming that leader that, that they need him to be. Uh, and then also, too, the, the product and the success of G-Day really – um, is in the palm of the play caller's hand. Yeah. So what you know, whatever Bobo and Kirby have decided, hey, what are we going to show on offense? What we're going to call. It, it really just kind of depends on what they want to do and and what they want to show the rest of the world. So, uh, G Day always kind of came down to, hey, who who's calling plays for you? And if they're going to dial it up, great. And if they're not, you're just going to kind of get a a bland product. But you're going to see him go out and operate. Uh, and do all the things that uh, that they need him to do as quarterback. Because one of the things I've always thought was interesting about that is is that you know a lot of other SEC teams do some ones against twos and things like that. And I've always sort of felt like I guess I'm a conspiracy theorist, but sometimes these teams sort of stack the deck so the offense can look good. But it seems like at Georgia they don't do as much of that, right? Where it's like you know one offense against the one defense a lot, and therefore twos against twos. So whatever you get offensively, you got to go out there and sort of earn it because you're playing your essential equivalent on the defensive side that Georgia doesn't stack the deck on G day for its offense, the way that some of these sec teams seem to No, I mean, that's what makes Kirby and Georgia different is that, Hey, it is a lot of good on good. The, the program is built around competition and constantly having to compete and earn your job. And, and no other way do you get better by just competing against the best of the best, uh, which is why Kirby believes so much and going ones on ones, good on good. Um, and then you see that even on G-Day, 
hey, it doesn't matter. It, 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 nobody cares who's going to have success, you know, on one side of the ball or the other. Uh, maybe the fans will, but um, uh, you're going to get a lot of players getting better because of that. Well, the other thing, too, is and I guess I'm weird about this. I like the fact that G-Day is still a real football game and the fact that the score starts off 0-0 zero to zero and, like, two yeah. teams are playing – Something that's yep. there's no special teams for the most part, but it's like a real football game where it's like some of these spring games are like glorified practices, and some of the teams have these like really weird, modified like scoring systems, and you have to have like an explainer to kind of understand what you're actually watching. I like the fact that G Day is a football game. It's zero to zero to begin with, and whichever team, red versus black, has the most most points wins the game. I sort of like the fact that it still sort of feels somewhat traditional. Yeah, leave the handicap stuff yes. for golf. Yeah, you know, shout out to the yes. Masters coming up this weekend. <laughs> leave that for golf. This is football. We play football. We start zero zero. Offense scores points. You know, two teams are playing each other, which I love about it. Thought was really cool. And um, you know, being a quarterback, like to me, like I'm I'm competing against the other team. Like I, I'm going out to try to beat this team and. Uh, but that's the way we looked at it. It's the way we viewed it, and you obviously wanted to come out and win. I even like the fact they use different locker rooms. You know, like the red team kind of dresses oh, okay. in the nice locker room. Oh, yeah. and the, the black team sort of dresses, or no, I guess it's the opposite, whatever. Uh, but, uh, you know, you, both sides, like they come out of different locker rooms. They have different opening videos. I like the fact that Georgia kind of gets into telling the story of, for today anyway, this is two different teams. That's right. That's right, man. And and it's, a, it's another, you know, Kirby's all about reps. And getting better, and it, all it is is another rep for those players who don't have maybe as much game experience for them to to come out and do everything just like it's a, a actual football game and get that rep to mentally prepare and get your mind right to go play a football game. I mean, Kirby does it does it the best. He's one of the best in the business, and that's that's how he he chooses to approach even this game. Maybe not. People look at it not as significant of a yeah. game. It's just a spring game. Hey, but, man, he he's intense all the time, and it means something. I want to talk about Gunnar Stockton for a minute. In our previous conversation, you certainly demonstrated Gunnar's a, a quarterback you got a lot of belief in. You think he's an intriguing prospect. You were complimentary of his G-Day performance a year ago, and I think a lot of fans are really excited to see something from him, too. And I, I guess here's what I'm curious of, you know, Jake. Like, how much growth do you expect Gunnar to show us on Saturday? And, you know, what's it like? Because – I feel like in Gunner's case, I think he's still a really impressive prospect. I have a lot of belief that he could be Georgia's starting quarterback next year. And yet, you know, we hear about possible transfers. We hear about, you know, elite recruits all the time. Like, give us a, a little bit of a reminder of how good you think Gunner can still be and what he might be able to put on display on Saturday. Yeah, I mean, physically, I think Gunner has all the tools needed to play football at a high level uh, at that level. Um, and even even the NFL level as well. Um, and then just just know what I know from Gunner, man, the the work that he puts in, the effort um, that he puts in watching film, learning the playbook. And man, I just uh, I hope he goes out and, and plays well and um, not necessarily put too much pressure on himself. But man, go out, own own the role that he's in. Um, and then, as always, uh, as a backup quarterback, man, being ready when your number is yeah. called and, and being able to, to take over a football team and, and take the football team to the next level. Speaking of elite recruits at quarterbacks, one of the things we got into the other day is Julian Juju Lewis, a five-star quarterback, had an interesting message where he kind of, what I would say, kind of maybe responded to some critics who have said, oh, he's about NIL and he's about this kind of thing. And he's like, listen, I'm more about development than than you know people are giving me credit for right now. And I think what I'm curious about from your standpoint is when you're a quarterback at a place like Georgia or when you're a recruit coming to Georgia, everybody sort of feels like they know you and everybody sort of tells themselves a story about what they think you're about, whether it's a good thing or a bad thing. What's that like to be a young guy and sort of feel like there's this narrative being cast around me that, that maybe I like, or maybe I think is true, or maybe I don't, maybe people are misunderstanding. And yet I'm not fully in control of my own story because People feel like they know me, and they're saying all this stuff about me. I've got to imagine for a young guy, even for someone like Juju, who seems to be a pretty, you know, you know, confident and, uh, uh, you know, you know, very measured young man. I got to imagine that's probably a really weird thing to have a bunch of people talking about you and you not really having a lot of control over what they're saying. And sometimes you feel like the stuff they're saying is not true. Yeah, I, I mean, I 100. percent I mean, I could definitely see that. Uh, just being such a, a very unique dynamic of. Hey, I, I feel like I'm one way. The people around me, closest to me, know know that that this is the way we do business uh, and the way I conduct and carry myself. And the way this this social media and media, you know, as soon as they kind of put a label on you, that's that's what you become. And 
Uh, I think, you know, for him, just, just being uh, true to himself, knowing who he is, um, and you just, you just can't let um, the outside noise maybe get to you. Um, and then I, I think as long as you just keep doing the things – uh, that you do, I, I think people around you will see it and respect it. Um, and I, I think a lot of respect is earned by just coming in and working, um, just lowering your head, getting to work, um, and you just earn a lot of respect on the football field. I've got another topic I want to hit with you in a moment here. Let me remind folks, though, this is our Kroger Fresh Take with Jake Fromm here on Dog Nation Daily. And, of course, one of the things we remind you of is you want to save more money, you want to get more time to enjoy the things you love this time of year, like Jake said, watching the Masters or Braves baseball, whatever else. Hey, the way to get more time to do the things you love is by becoming a member of Kroger Boost. When you become a Kroger Boost member, you're going to get free grocery delivery. That means you don't have to go all over town getting your stuff. Kroger brings that right to you. And during this time in which it seems like everything's getting more expensive, including perhaps sometimes fuel prices, you can save money at the fuel pump there as well when it comes to Kroger Boost, too, because you get two fuel points for every dollar you spend right there at your local Kroger. So you can try that, get a uh, get a chance to experience all of that online. It's Kroger.com slash boost for more on that. That's Kroger.com slash boost for more on that. All right, Jake, last thing. I know you've been busy. You've been going through uh, some of your uh, off-season work and things like that. You may not have seen this, but the other day there was a little bit of chatter. I don't think this is true, but it, it's certainly been a conversation starter about the idea that we may really be getting closer to some important, powerful people trying to push for this breakaway of college football into what's kind of being called a super league where it'd be 70 or 80 teams banding together conferences, perhaps coming to an end as we've understood them. It seems like the sec is not in favor of this. And so therefore likely not to happen here right now, but it also seems like these conversations are getting a little more serious, even if it's not quite time for all that to take place as of yet. You know, what do you make of, of, of all of this? I know how much you love baseball. It seems like if you broke away the football and you tried to have the other sports without that, a sport like baseball might suffer. We've all, you know, been kind of impressed by what Caitlin Clark's been doing. It seems like women's basketball might suffer from that, too. There's or in all other kinds of sports there as well. It seems like there'd be, in other words, a lot that you'd still have to answer about all of this. But it also seems like at some point in time, some really, really new model might become a reality. Have you followed this? And and what do you think about all of that that's kind of out there related to this sort of topic here right now? Yeah, at the moment, I would say I'm very naive to um, kind of the dynamics in college football with the, the leagues and separating. It's actually funny that you mentioned it today on the show because we talked about it in the quarterback room okay. uh, today about, about the Super League. So there's, there's so many different opinions. Um, I, I think – uh, the perfect, there may not be a perfect answer. Um, I, I'm just so curious to see what it becomes. I really hope the right people get in the right room, lock the door and figure this whole yeah. thing out. Um, that just, there's, there's just a lot of gray and a lot, a lot up in the air. And, uh, I think it, I think it'll be good for the, the college athletes. I think it'll be good for the, the young athletes aspiring to play in college. Um, and I think it'll be great obviously too, for the fans, just, just knowing what product they're getting and what they're buying into, uh, to watch. But, um, as of right now, it just really looks like the trend is going towards college football, becoming more of a professional yeah. sport. So, um, what, what does the NCAA really do now? I, I don't, I don't know. Um, and I, they, they've lost a lot of power in this. Um, maybe that's a good thing. I, I, I think probably losing a little bit of power is a good thing, yeah. but there's so many different, uh, ways this could go, and I'm just really curious to see how it all unfolds. Uh, before we let you go, mom and baby doing good right now? Family happy? Everybody good there? Yep, doing great. Yes, sir. Thank but, you for asking. But you are away from them right now up there uh, in the uh, D.C. area for uh, some of the off-season workouts, right? Yep, yep. So uh, away during the week, coming back on the weekends um, to spend some time, man. Time is precious, and, uh, man, you, you go away for a week, and, man, he's already – growing up and uh and getting big fast so trying to soak up all the time i can well i certainly know that you will do all of that for sure jake we appreciate your time thanks for being with us here today and uh, obviously looking forward to seeing some of the stuff we've talked about on g day there on saturday and then getting a chance to talk to you about that very soon here again as well as a part of a kroger fresh take we appreciate your time yeah brandon can't wait thank you Really good stuff there from the former Georgia quarterback, Jake Fromm. And speaking of good stuff, we got good stuff on tap for Saturday in addition to G-Day. Dog Nation coverage of G-Day both before and after. Our home away from home is going to be right there at the UGA bookstore. Many of you have asked. I want to make sure I give you information about this. 
in addition to Dog Nation being on hand, including myself, uh, there on Saturday at the UGA Bookstore. Don't forget, also, as you've come to expect, big autograph signings there as well. In fact, coming up on Saturday before the game, you've got the great former Georgia quarterback, the national champion, Buck Ballou, going to be signing copies of his book. And how about this? Kamari Lassiter on hand for autographs there as well. That's from 10.30 a.m. till 12.30 p.m. coming up on Saturday. Buck Ballou, Kamari Lassiter. I'm also told a special guest, surprise guest, coming up there as well, too. So uh, a special surprise guest. Who knows who that's going to be? But uh, Kamari Lassiter, uh, the uh, future star in the NFL, and Buck Ballou, the national champion quarterback, signing copy of his book. Really special opportunity to get some great autographs from a couple of Great former UGA stars. All of that going down 10:30 until 12:30 p.m. at the 10:30 a.m. 12:30 p.m. at the UGA bookstore. Coming up on Saturday prior to the game, I'll see you there along with Kaylee Mansell for the pregame. Then I'll be back with you as I always am for the uh, Dog Nation postgame show immediately after the game there as well. As we wrap up today, obviously we're kind of rolling into Masters Week, and so many of you reaching out to be a part of our Golden Shoe Masters Pool, which I certainly love. And in addition to that, we got a Masters-themed uh, golden shoe today that also shouts out our friends at the Finnish Long Drink. Johnny Prescott wrote this into the Facebook comment section of the day. He goes, B.A., finally found the Long Drink peach flavor over the weekend. I think I'll save a couple to pair with the pimento cheese sandwich for some quintessential Georgia-style Masters viewing. Johnny, you are a man after my own heart there on that. You love to see it. A little peach-flavored version of the Finnish Long Drink to go with some Pimento cheese sandwiches, getting ready for the uh, Masters, all of that a great idea and certainly golden shoe worthy here today. Lousy stinking Gators, they don't have anything like that going on in their lives. It's been 1,250 days since they've beaten Georgia. That's our Gator Hater Updater. They'll have a great day. We'll see you back here tomorrow on Dog Nation Daily, presented by Breda Pest Management. And on video time now for the R.S. Andrews Cooldown. R.S. Andrews, the one you turn to for your air conditioning, heating, Plumbing and electric needs. They show up on time. They do the work that's promised. The price is promised. You can trust them on all of that. So, as I told you before, tomorrow during the RS Andrews cooldown, your calls during the cooldown. Why are we doing this? Because it's G Day week and we're doing it bigger than it's ever been done before, basically. So, yes, tomorrow during G Day or during the cooldown, getting ready for G Day, we'll take your calls. You want to talk about what's going to happen during the game? We we'll talk about what's uh, going to happen with the recruiting stuff around the game. Uh, you want to talk about the, the transfer portal after that. We will cover all of that ground. Long show today. We're trying not to do the shows quite so long. And by we, I mean me. But uh, a little long today. But nonetheless, we're going to get in here and get going on your comments. I hope everybody is in a good mood and ready to go on all of that. High energy, uh, a lot of enthusiasm. Nothing but happy things going on. All right. Let's see what else is happening here. Uh, Porter wondering if maybe Bear Alexander would transfer those lousy stinking gators. Listen, uh, he'd probably fit in. He'd probably fit in very well over there. Uh, for sure. Uh, Johnny Surf Dog says losing Bear and A.D. Mitchell cost us the three P changed my mind. I mean, maybe so. Maybe so. I, I, I mean, obviously, you don't like to lose good players. But at the same time, I mean, I guess I would say that if your championship host rests on not having anybody transfer out, you're probably, you're probably, you know, not as much of a championship contender as you'd like to be, right? I mean, not fun to lose AD, not fun to lose Bear Alexander, but it's like this is a convoluted uh, narrative, or I should say, convoluted analogy. But think of it this way: it's like if you want to have like rental property, you want to make money on like a like a shopping center or an apartment complex, something like that, you got to factor in a little bit of a vacancy rate. Like if your business plan doesn't account for a vacancy rate, then your, your numbers aren't going to work. I would say the same thing is sort of true for, um, for, a, for a roster. That if your roster doesn't have some attrition baked into it, uh, then, then you're not going to meet the appropriate expectations. You've got you to assume some attrition. Kirby Smart has said they only expect to keep 70% of the players they sign out of high school. In other words, you know, their expectation is to almost lose a third of the guys they bring in. That's just kind of a fact of life. But I know what you're saying. Jonathan Aaron says, go ahead and let the cat out of the bag. I, I, I'm the special guest at the UJ Bookstore. I will be there, but I don't think I count as a special guest. 
Maybe they're like WrestleMania. Maybe maybe they got John Cena and The Undertaker and Seth Rollins and Shield Gear. Maybe maybe that's what they've got going on there. Uh, who knows? Um, Taylor Russell says the title hopes weren't solely reliant on those two guys, but eventually within any roster you reach a tipping point on winning games. Yeah, I mean it's hard to win thirty games in a row. It is. Um, uh, I, I think that's probably the case. I mean. Like it's sour grapes to say I think I still think that Georgia was the best team last year, but I still do think Georgia was the the, the best team last year. Now, Georgia did not have the best defensive line in America. That's true. Uh, Alabama's defensive line played better than Georgia, and Michigan's defensive line played better against Alabama than Georgia's did. So that may be the reason that Georgia didn't win the national championship, and maybe not having Barry Alexander is one of the reasons why. Perhaps that's the case, but um, but ultimately, you know, why were we all watching the playoff on TV as opposed to being there? I would say it came down to the Michigan defensive line was better. The Alabama defensive line at least played better uh, than Georgia's did. Uh, a nature gator says, Bear Alexander be welcomed almost anywhere. I mean, I even said this. Look, here's the deal you got to understand is that there is, there is still a lot of talent in Bear Alexander. Now, that USC coaching staff is simply not capable of unearthing it. Um, you know, they're just not, you know, they couldn't coach their way out of a wet paper bag on defense. Now, supposedly they got new coach and that's all going to change. But, uh, but they were not capable of getting anything out of Bear Alexander. But Alexander's still got talent. You know, he's, he's probably damaged goods from a UGA standpoint and probably with good reason. But the uh, this is one of those in which Nature Gator is right. The list on Alexander is not a short one in terms of teams who are going to be interested in him. That is, that is true. That is true. Paul Moon also pointing out the Lad McConkey injury. Now, the one thing um, I, I, I will never be – what Bama fans became and what, you know, Ohio State fans became about making my whole personality around wide receiver injuries. I'll never do that. Uh, but, you know, not having a lad hurt. It did hurt. It hurt. Um, let's see what else. Um, and G. Grace asking about lad's draft status. I mean, some of these teams seem to really like lad a lot. Um I always assumed that McConkie would be a second-round pick, not a first-round pick, but some of these teams seem to really like it. Um, sometimes uh, some of these teams seem to really like him. Let's see what else. Uh, D-Mart says Tex A&M is his guess. Somebody mentioned this to me on X. If after all these years, <laughs> Bear Alexander finally ends up at Tex A&M, uh, that would be something. Um. All right, let's go to uh, dognation.com here for a moment. Uh, Andrew Sisson says, what time is the dog walk on Saturday? And does G-Day start at 1? Yeah, G-Day starts at 1. Dog walk on a G-Day is usually a little bit of a moving target. I'd say it's probably around 11. They may have a specific time somewhere, um, but probably around 11. Um, uh, DT said he had to go to a funeral for someone there in Augusta and some of the uh, folks in attendance for the uh, for the ceremony were wearing their green jackets and uh, you know a show of respect for for you know someone I guess was also a member and yeah I mean that's obviously um, I mean, if you earn that status of course you would of course be very proud of that one of the things also interesting to see is is that if you go to the masters you know um, the the members jackets say Augusta National, whereas like the Masters winner says the Masters. And so I believe the only like green jacket in their apparel, the only stuff that says Augusta National is an Augusta National member. Am I right about this? Um, it's fascinating. To go to the apparel, uh, like the merch store, is one of the craziest things you'll ever see because – I mean, there are people who are buying everything. Now, some of them are just huge Masters fans. There's a pretty big secondary market. And, like, I was buying – I went to the uh, Anwa last year and bought one hat 
the guy in front of me got rang up. I'm not kidding. This is not a joke for like $15,000 worth of stuff, like, like a five figure sum of money uh, of, I mean, he's just buying stacks of hats, stacks of shirts. And, you know, this is not like a, you know, limit three, like, like toilet paper during the pandemic. This was apparently not limit three per customer. He just, just buying it uh, like $15,000 worth of stuff. Uh, pretty, pretty wild, pretty wild. Uh, Ryan Walker's got Mike Smith, the former Falcons head coach, coming into his show tomorrow. Mike Smith is one of the great guys in the world. Ryan Walker versus Mike Smith in an interview setting will be very, very good. Ryan's a great dude. So y'all check out the Birdcage uh, Ryan show. Uh, Mike Smith coming on. I'm telling you right now, Mike Smith is the nicest dude ever. And for my money, best Falcons coach of all time, I think. Um, Dan Reeves, I guess, would be, be pretty close. But I believe I'll go Mike Smith, best Falcons coach of all time. A uh, really, really good guy. Really, really good guy. Uh, so DT says the deceased was not a member of the club, but some of the, those who were were his friends. So an incredible show of respect there. That's a really interesting story, DT. I appreciate you sharing that. Uh, let's see what else is going on here. Let me go to Facebook here for a minute. See what's going on there. See if folks are having a good time over there. We're going to wrap up here in a little bit, too, just because we've got so much going on. But tomorrow, your calls during this portion of the show. And we'll try to end the show significantly earlier to make more time for that. All right, on Facebook. Johnny Prescott says, some great sports days in the calendar. And for spring Saturday... Uh, this upcoming Saturday, not too shabby. G Day, Georgia baseball at Foley, Masters, Braves from Miami. That is a good Saturday right there, Johnny. You are right about that. You are right about that. Uh, Mike Mazell says, got to love a boss who loves calling those 10 o'clock meetings. Mike, I hate to hear that. I'm going to give Mike a shout out, too, uh, if he's still with us. Maybe he had to go to a meeting or maybe he's just gotten, gotten back from one. I told him this in email yesterday. I'm pretty sure, my memory, not always the best, but I'm pretty sure Mike was the first one to sign up for both our Masters Pool, Golden Shoe Masters Pool, and our Golden Shoe uh, Bracket Challenge. I'm pretty sure Mike was the first one to request uh, entry for both of them. So, uh, Mike, strong performance there. Jamie Huff says we should take Bear back to keep him away from... uh, 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 Bama or Auburn or Clemson. So, yeah, there you go. <laughs> Maybe that's the case. Uh, bring him back for just that purpose alone. Yeah, Brian Jordan, he's uh, confirming what I said before. And if your gear says Augusta National, uh, that means you got that from a member or you are a member. So, there you go. It's sort of like, it, I don't know if you know this is still true anymore, but like anything with like the presidential seal, came from the White House. Is that a thing? You heard about that? Like, if you get, like, you know, the anything with the presidential seal on it, like, you can't sell the presidential seal. Did you ever hear that? This day and age, I'm not even sure that's even still true anymore. Oh, so you have Augusta National, our, our, our producer, Jay Black, you have Augusta National hats? Wow, from member. I'm, I'm telling you, like, you talk about, like, uh, that, we have very sophisticated people behind the scenes here. Jay Black, Apparently uh, hanging out with the uh, membership there at Augusta National. So very, very impressive stuff. Jay also has a master shirt on today there as well. Um, I've got a couple of master's hats. I don't typically wear a hat on the show <laughs> just because I have a giant head. Maybe I'll wear a master's hat at some point this week. Um, oh, so Philip Jordan Wells says, says they sell presidential seal hats now at Dulles Airport. So apparently whatever, you know, uh, whatever used to be true about not selling the presidential seal, apparently that's not the case anymore. Uh, Bobby Labonte has passed away. Very sad stuff to hear there for a NASCAR legend. Very sad stuff to hear. Labonte, I mean to say. Um, uh, Matt Rukvina says, while everyone else is getting softer with their gimmick spring games, Kirby sticking with toughness makes you appreciate him even more. Yeah, and I want to make, I'm not, like, I'm trying to, you know, be as honest as I can about this. I really don't think it makes Georgia better, but it's just better for us. In other words, I sort of wonder if in the future, 
you know, people say, well, maybe you should play another opponent for your spring game. And maybe one of these days you will. If I'm really being honest, I don't know there still is a G day in my lifetime. Like, I almost wonder if one of these days it just might not happen anymore. But while it does happen, the fact that Georgia makes it a football game, I really do appreciate that. I, I do. I mean, I reckon we'd get excited about whatever it was. But the fact that it is something that lo- sort of looks and feels like real football makes – I mean, like we've had people in our comment section even today, like Masters and Braves and Diamond Dogs and like G-Day. Like they treat that, and most of us treat that as the number one sporting event that's happening this weekend, but treat it as a major sporting event alongside anything else. And I would say you lose a lot of that if it's, well, the defense is going to start the game winning 27 to nothing, and if the offense scores more points than that, they get a chance to win. Or it's like the – it's like playing backgammon uh, with the Ohio State format of, like, you know, who's got what, what's the score, like, all of it's just crazy. Uh, Tim- Timothy Wilson says, what's your favorite Masters uh, pool team name so far? I'll have to check that out, Timothy, and we'll have to see how that's uh, turning out to be right now. Uh, Timothy is also a part of our uh, uh, pool. I exchanged emails with him yesterday, too. Jamie Huff says he wrote a letter to Amy Carter in elementary school and got a letter back with the presidential seal on it. That's really interesting. Also, you hear about people who go to the White House and they'll get like uh, M&Ms with the presidential seal on it or something like that. I'm kind of a sucker for stuff like that. And I, we don't talk politics here. We never will. But if I could go to the White House, I don't care who the president is. I just want to be there. I, I'm interested in stuff like that. Um, just always kind of have been. And... I'd like to have something with the presidential seal on it. Uh, Cherie Hudson Byron says, uh, "Unless you it, about you don't get to watch the game unless you're there, unless you get SEC Network Plus." But here's the thing to understand, Cherie, and I know this is somewhat convoluted, but if you get the SEC Network, you do get SEC Network Plus. It is not pay per view, um, and most of you do have the SEC network because you're watching those Georgia games during the fall when they're on the SEC network. Now, the question you ask is, okay, well, how do I access it? This is one of those deals where it sort of depends on who your cable provider is or or your your TV provider is. Sort of depends on your TV provider is. But for my TV provider, and I'm not going to give them a plug because they don't pay for my cable, but it's, it's like one click and I'm there. So your provider is probably something close to that there, too. Or if your TV is sort of a smart TV apart from your provider. But this is the thing that I don't think ESPN and the SEC Network do a good job of explaining this because I don't know how much they care. Uh, but, But if you subscribe to ESPN or if you subscribe to the SEC Network, you do get this game. There is a subscription to ESPN Plus that, like, UFC is on and a bunch of other nonsense is on, but that's not what this is. Um, this is available as a part of the ESPN Plus subscription, I believe, but if you subscribe via your TV provider to the SEC Network, you do get SEC Network Plus. And, you know, how you would then access that is going to be based on, like, what your cable provider is. Um Eric Ray, I cannot read that. I cannot read that comment. Uh, Jonathan Moore says, B.A. to the White House in 2024. Yeah, I don't think I'd want to be president, but I'd like to run for president. That seems really fun. Um, I don't think I'd want to be president. And in fact, over the course of years, once again, I'm not going to get specific about this, but we've seen a few candidates that started doing kind of well, and all of a sudden... They're like, I'm not sure I want to run for president anymore. Like, it's it's one thing to go give some speeches and, you know, shake some hands and go see the world, you know, travel the country. It's another thing to think about actually having to do the job. Uh, at, you know, over the course of time, we've seen some guys who had a chance to to maybe make a push. When they got closer, what is the, what was it? Uh, is it Icarus? Is that the guy who flew cl- too close to the sun? There, there are a few people as they got a little close. Isn't that kind of what Ross Perot did? I was young. But when Perot started doing well, he just dropped out of the race. Then he got back in. But it's like it's like some people like the idea of running for president. They don't really want to be president. Um, I feel like that's what I would be. I'd love to run for president. Uh, I have no desire to do the job. I, I don't. I don't want to manage anything here. Uh, I'm not the most organized person. Um, but I would love to give the speeches and do stuff like that. I'd love that. Uh, 
Jonathan Moore says you make more uh, money uh, running for president. Anyway, do you know what that would do for my profile as Dog Nation Daily host? If I made my whole platform like, you know, battling the nefarious forces that are trying to ruin college football, do you know what that would do for my audience numbers? I feel like that'd be great. All right, we got to go. Uh, one final trip around the Congress. Um, Paul Moon says, you know, this is not a political statement, but you have to be a, a narcissist to want to be president. You know, there was a thing, like back in the 1800s, it was considered bad form to campaign, right? Like the people running for president didn't want to be seen publicly campaigning. Uh, <laughs> things have changed. <laughs> Let me just say it that way. Things have changed. Um Let's see what else. Uh, Crow King 123 says the before and after pictures of the presidents are kind of haunting because, you know, so I have a little bit of a theory about this. On the one hand, I do think the job ages. I don't think there's any doubt about that. But I do have to admit something. Honesty compels me to admit, y'all, a lot of us aren't holding up well over the course of eight years. Like um, eight years ago puts me fairly early days of dog nation. Like I've aged a bunch in eight years too. I mean, now maybe not as bad as the president's age, age it's a much more stressful job, but you know, time is not fun to any, is not kind to anybody in terms of like the physical appearance, you know, stuff. So I do think that the thing about the president's aging is probably true. There are other jobs that probably kind of function that way a little bit as well. But eight years is a you know what for almost anybody. Uh, just sometimes anyway. Um, uh, let's see what else. Anything else over here? A little bit of draft talk over here right now. William Perry checking in to give you a go, dogs. You'd love to see that. Uh, Paul Moon wondering what Tebow's career would have been like if he'd switched positions from the jump. Yeah, you kind of wonder if Cam Newton doesn't steal a laptop, what happens to Tim Tebow after that? I think it's a fair question to kind of wonder about. Uh, maybe nothing. Maybe Tebow beats him out, but you do kind of wonder about that. Uh, DT says, I don't want to uh, be present because it would turn my hair gray. Um, I am trying to hold on to what little I have. Although, I, you know, I've talked about this will be the last point we're, going, we're leaving after this. I talked about a lot about WrestleMania this week. It's interesting how how little hair John Cena has on top right now. And he's kind of grown his hair out long as a, in hopes of kind of covering some of that up. Uh, makes me feel a little bit better about, you know, trying to hold on to the, like the last vestiges of my own youth. If John Cena's got the bald spot on top, then, you know, I, no telling him what kind of hair dye he's using. Then, then, then maybe it's okay if it comes for us all. Um, George Ann Olive, by the way, says, if I ran for president, the media would be all over my wrestling fanboy history. Yeah, listen, there, there's no telling what they would turn up on me. But but if you watch, what you understand is you just deny it all. Whatever whatever dirt they turn up, eh, listen. It was either a different time. <laughs> listen, that's a long time ago. I'm here to talk about the present. That's all I got to say. Hey, listen, that's a long time ago. I'm here to talk about the present. Uh, or, you know, I have no memory of that. That's all you got to do. That's all you got to do. All right, we got to go for now. Y'all find R.S. Andrews online at rsandrews.com for your air conditioning, heating, plumbing, electric needs. They show up on time, do the work that's promised, the price is promised. You can trust R.S. Andrews on all of that for your air conditioning, heating, plumbing, electric needs. It means if your water heater goes out, in many cases, R.S. Andrews can get it replaced for you the same day. So find them online. Boy, the uh, master's pool entries continue to roll in. I'm so excited about this. I really am happy how, how, how successful this has sort of turned out to be. So... Very happy about that. Y'all have a great day. Check out R.S. Andrews online at rsandrews.com. And we'll see you back here tomorrow on Dog Nation Daily, presented by Breda Pass Management. Your phone calls as a part of the cool down tomorrow. So we'll see you there for that. Have a good day, everybody.